मेरा नाम अपूर्वानंद है और हम नेहरू डायलॉग सीरीज़ के तहत आज की बातचीत में यहाँ इकट्ठा हुए हैं और हमारे साथ टेलर शमन हैं जो लंदन स्कूल ऑफ इकनॉमिक्स में पढ़ाती हैं और हिंदुस्तान में जिनके अकादमिक रुचि है और इस किताब के पहले जिस पर हम चर्चा करने जा रहे हैं टेलर शमन की दो किताबें मुस्लिम बिलोंगिंग्स इन सेक्यूलर इंडिया और स्टेट वायलेंस एंड पनिशमेंट इन इंडिया ये दो किताबें प्रकाशित हो चुकी हैं इनके विषय से आपको कुछ आभास अंदाज हो रहा होगा कि टेलर की विद्वत्ता या उनकी स्कॉलरशिप की दिशा क्या है और उनके ख़ास दिलचस्पियाँ क्या हैं यह किताब नेहरूज़ इंडिया हिस्ट्री इन सेवन मिथ्स पिछले साल आई हाँ और इस इस किताब पे चर्चा शुरू हुई और मैंने इस किताब पर टेलर शर्मन का एक संक्षिप्त लेख हिंदुस्तान टाइम्स में पढ़ा और ऐसा लगा कि यह नेहरू के हिंदुस्तान को देखने का एक नया नज़रिया है लेकिन उसके पहले जो लोग आज पहली बार शामिल हो रहे हैं नेहरू डायलॉग सीरीज़ में उनको हम सूचित करना चाहते हैं कि यह श्रृंखला संवादों की श्रृंखला है नेहरू डायलॉग सीरीज़ कहने से यह भ्रम नहीं होना चाहिए कि हम यह श्रृंखला नेहरू के विचारों का प्रचार करने के लिए की जा रही है और जैसा इस बातचीत में खुद आपको पता चलेगा और टेलर शर्मन कहती हैं कि नेहरू ने स्वयं कोई आइडियोलॉजी या विचारधारा बनाने से भरसक परहेज किया जिससे उनके चाहने वालों को इस बात की सहूलत ना मिल जाए सुविधा ना मिल जाए कि वे नेहरू की विचारधारा का प्रचार प्रसार करने लगें तो एक तरह से इसका इंतज़ाम खुद नेहरू ने कर लिया था और यह संवाद संवाद श्रृंखला अगर नेहरू के नाम पर है तो सिर्फ इसलिए कि नामों का एक महत्व है नाम प्रतीक भी बन जाते हैं और अगर नेहरू किसी एक चीज़ के प्रतीक हैं तो वह है संवाद जिसमें आप दूसरे के नज़रिए को समझने की कोशिश करते हैं सिर्फ आप दूसरे को खुद से राजी कराने की कोशिश नहीं करते बल्कि खुद भी दूसरों के नज़रिए के प्रति आपका रवैया खुला रहता है इसलिए इस संवाद श्रृंखला या डायलॉग सीरीज़ की फ़िक्रें या इसके कंसर्न्स तो वे ज़रूर हैं जो नेहरू के थे और वे जो किसी भी ऐसे इन, इंसान के होंगे जिसकी इंसानियत में जिसका यकीन है आ, लेकिन वह नेहरू के इर्द गिर्द नहीं घूमता रहेगा इसलिए हम बहुत सारी किताबों पर चर्चा करेंगे जो सीधे नेहरू पर नहीं हैं ऐसे बहुत आ, सारे संवाद होंगे जिनमें हो सकता है नेहरू कहीं नहीं हो जैसा इस किताब को पढ़ते हुए आपको पता चलेगा कि इस किताब के अध्यायों में नेहरू शायद आ, जिसे हम नाटक की भाषा में कहते हैं वे कहीं पीछे हैं नेपथ्य में नेहरू मंच पर नहीं है इज़ नॉट ऑन स्टेज वो कहीं नेपथ्य में दिखलाई पड़ते हैं इसके पहले कि हम बातचीत शुरू करें और तरीका यह होगा कि मैं टेलर शर्मन से के लिए कुछ सवाल हमने तैयार किए हैं और वे हिंदी में हैं यह यह चर्चा द्विभाषी होगी हिंदी और टेलर अंग्रेज़ी में अपनी बात करेंगी मैंने उनको सवाल तैयार करके भेज दिए थे लेकिन किताब के बारे में संक्षेप में मैं यह कहना चाहता हूँ कि यह किताब नेहरू के वक्त के हिंदुस्तान को देखने की कोशिश करती है और यह किताब यह बतलाने की कोशिश करती है कि जब हम नेहरूज़ इंडिया कहते हैं तो यह अपने आप में एक मिथ के निर्माण की तरफ आगे बढ़ता है जिसमें उस वक्त जो कुछ भी हिंदुस्तान में हो रहा था उसकी सारी जिम्मेदारी हम नेहरू पर आयत कर देते हैं और नेहरू को उन सब के लिए हम जवाबदेह भी बना देते हैं इस इस बुनियादी मिथ की चिंता से यह किताब लिखी गई है और यह समझने की कोशिश करती है कि दरअसल वह पूरा वक्त यानी 1947 से लेकर 1964 का वक्त 
प्रयोगों का वक्त था एक्सपेरिमेंट्स का वक्त था वह तरह तरह के उम्दा दिमागों के सक्रिय होने का वक्त था और नेहरू की भूमिका अगर कोई कुछ थी जिसको टेलर कहती हैं तो वह एक सरपरस्त की पैटर्न की एक जगह वह लिखती हैं कि वो चीफ इनाग्रेटर हैं रिबन काटते हैं और उनके पास अगर कोई एक विचार लेकर आता है तो नेहरू उत्साह के साथ उसको पैटर्नाइज करने निकल पड़ते हैं लेकिन नेहरू किसी भी एक चीज़ को कॉलोनाइज करने या उस पर अपनी छाप छोड़ने की हड़बड़ी में या उसकी चिंता नेहरू को नहीं है यह टेलर कहती हैं शुरुआत के अध्याय में टेलर ने यह लिखा है कि उन्होंने श्याम बेनेगल की फिल्म से अपनी बात शुरू की है उस पर मैं बहुत विस्तार से बात नहीं करना चाहता लेकिन उन्होंने ये कहा है कि नेहरू के भारत में जो आइकोनोग्राफी विकसित हो रही थी अगर उसे आप देखें तो वह नेहरू और भारत एकमेक हैं ऐसी कोशिश नहीं हो रही थी बल्कि उस वक्त अगर कुछ हो रहा था तो गांधी को एक आइकन के रूप में ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा स्थापित किया जा रहा था और नेहरू की भी इसमें रुचि थी मुझे उनके इस अध्याय को पढ़ते हुए आर के करंजिया के साथ नेहरू के के इंटरव्यूज़ याद आए जो आर के करंजिया ने उन्नीस से चौंसठ के बीच लिए थे और उसमें एक जगह आर के करंजिया नेहरू को कहते हैं कि एम आई एड्रेसिंग नेहरू द स्टेट्स और नेहरू कहते हैं कि नो देर वॉज ओनली वन स्टेट्स मैन दैट वॉज गांधी and we are gandhi's children and we are children of gandhi era to ye ki ye puri avadhi jaisa baad mein pracharit kiya gaya ki har cheez ko nehru ke naam par to nehru ko is cheez se thodi vitrishna bhi thi detest is it lekin ab main bahut vistar mein iske nahi jaunga aur taylor ko jo maine sawal bhej diye hain उनसे अब बात शुरू करूंगा उनका शुक्रिया अदा करते हुए दिल्ली में उनका कार्यक्रम बहुत ज़्यादा व्यस्त है इसके बावजूद उन्होंने बहुत जल्दी में हमारा अनुरोध माना इत्तफाक से हमें पता चला कि वो दिल्ली आ रही हैं हिंदुस्तान आ रही हैं दिल्ली रहेंगी और उन्होंने हमारा अनुरोध स्वीकार किया इसके लिए बहुत शुक्रिया टेलर पहला सवाल बहुत पिटा पिटाया कि इस किताब का ख्याल क्यों आया और कैसे आया मेरी आवाज सुनाई दे रही है आपको ओके सो द ओरिजिन ऑफ दिस बुक कम्स फ्रॉम द लास्ट प्रोजेक्ट दैट आई डिड व्हिच इज अ नॉर्मल वे टू स्टार्ट अ बुक फॉर अ हिस्टोरियन आई वाज वर्किंग ऑन सेक्युलरिज्म इन इंडिया and of course i naturally read the works that had been written in the 80s and 90s and the early 21st century about secularism I was working on uh, secularism in the 1940s and 50s and, uh, in India. And as I read the works that had been written in the later period, in the late 20th century and in the early 21st century, you will all be familiar with the debates about secularism. You will all know that there's kind of two, uh, two, two stories about how secularism worked or didn't work in the Nehru years. And I read these two stories and I looked at the documents I was looking at in the 1940s and 50s and I thought, neither one of these stories fits what I was seeing in the 1950s. And so I thought, um, well, maybe this is true of all the things that we think we know about Nehru, all those abstract nouns, secularism, socialism, non-alignment, the strong state, the successful democracy, the modernization. Maybe the way we speak about them in the 20th and 21st century isn't how people in the 1950s thought about these terms. And so the object, the object of the book was to look at how people at the time, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, understood these terms, how they debated these terms, and how they evaluated the success of the programs that were established on the basis of these terms, but then also to ask, is that all there is, right? We have these kind of, uh, this small group of abstract nouns, but maybe there's more to the Nehru era than Nehruvianism. So that's the, the origin of the book. So in the first chapter, Nehru the architect, you write, and I, read it from the book uh, the idea that nehru towered over india sculpting it to his will is simply a myth 
that's what you write. Like all great men, his greatness was not only reliant upon, but was produced by a web of human interactions, objects and institutions. His conception of his own power was that it was very modest. Uh, he preferred not to turn his ideas into ideology. And then you write, uh, quoting uh, or referring to his essay, The Basic Approach, uh, how exasperated he was with people who, whether through religion or ideology, believed that they had all the answers to world's problem. He, d he derided those who held to their principles without acknowledging that others might have some share of the truth also. Uh, such a dogmatic approach, he declared, was wholly unscientific, unreasonable, and uncivilized, whether it is applied in the realm of religion or economic theory or anything else, and so on. So, you say that in the Bharat ke nirmata ke roop mein, uh, ya architect ke roop mein, jo Nehru ka myth tha, usse Nehru ko hi atraaz tha. Uh, Nehru didn't like it. So, ya myth unhe, unko samajhne mein, Nehru ko samajhne mein, aur Nehru ke Hindustan ko samajhne mein, kis tarah ek rukawat hai, ek obstacle hai. Nehru, the architect of India. Okay, so, um, First of all, I think my answer comes, uh, I'll answer first as a historian, right? In terms of disposition, in terms of historical methodology, I am a social and cultural historian. So I'm personally not uh, disposed to think that great men shape the world. That's a personal disposition. I tend to think that um, even one person, their ideas are shaped with, uh, in interaction with other people. Nehru himself loved to debate. He always took his opponents in a debate seriously. And we have to take the idea um, seriously that his ideas were shaped by others, right? And that he was also shaped by the institutions around him, even as he tried to shape them. This is an iterative process. Uh, nobody stands alone as an individual. We're all shaped by uh, the people and the institutions around us. So that's a disposition. But then I think um, if we look at India in the 19. 40s, 50s, 60s, there's 300 350 million, 450 million people in India across that period. It's much more interesting to understand India um, through wider processes, larger numbers of people, uh, than, than, through the, than through the eyes or ideas of, of one man, I think. So you say uh, 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 that overemphasis on uh, Nehru's works, which were published, uh, and you think that this overemphasis was an obstacle to understand uh, Nehru's era or Nehru period or Nehru's India. Why do you say so? So um, the selected works of Jawaharlal Nehru are an amazing resource for historians. Really fantastic that they've been compiled. The problem is there's not much else to complement them, right? So the selected works have Nehru's speeches, Nehru's letters, but it's often hard to uh, figure out what his interlocutors were saying to him, right? And when we think about how policy is developed or how uh, a bill moves through the Lok Sabha, all that information is contained in the files, the everyday files of the, of the Ministry of, um, uh, the Home Ministry or the Ministry of External Affairs. And none, very little of that is available to historians. And so it's not so much that the selected works are the barrier, but the fact that that's all that we have, or rather, rather, that's mostly what we have. And so when historians get a bit lazy and look only to the selected works, then, then we end up with a, a skewed understanding of how Nehru operated or uh, of Nehru's India. Next, we come to non-alignment. Uh, and the, the metaphor that you uh, take is very interesting that if India's foreign policy or international policy is, uh, is a six yard sari, agar wa chhe gaz ki sari hai, to uh, non-alignment ek zari ka kaam hai us par. Why do you say so? It's not in unjust. Okay, um, so why is non-alignment like the zari work on a palu of a sari? Yeah. Um, it's the, it's the bit that everyone pays attention to. It's the beautiful bit, 
it, took, it takes a lot of time to craft the Zari work on the palu of a Zari. Um, and I, so I'm not saying that non-alignment wasn't important. I'm not saying that they didn't put a lot of time into it. But it doesn't match the material reality of India in the 1940s and 50s. So let me explain. Yeah. Uh, India was born from the British Empire, yes. <laughs> so in 1947, and the British Empire was, of course, the center of global capitalism in the 19th century. And it handed over uh, its supremacy in global capitalism to the US by the, by the end of the Second World War. But when India achieved freedom from the British, it didn't, wasn't born into complete freedom, it was born into an intimate set of entanglements with that capitalist bloc. So uh, throughout the 1940s, 50s and 60s, Britain and the US remained India's number one and number two trading partners. Uh, India received much more aid from the US than they did from the Soviet Union. So India received, from up to the end of the Nehru years, India received about more than six billion US dollars in aid from the US. It's more than the US gave to Pakistan as well. How much did India get from the Soviet Union? Just over a billion. Uh, in terms, so aid, trade, military, military. Uh, when it comes to military entanglements, the, it, all of India's military arrangements face west. Take, uh, the, take airplanes and uh, flying vehicles of various kinds. So throughout the 50s and 60s, India received I think about two dozen military aircraft from the Soviets. Yeah? In the meantime, they received more than 200 from the French, more than 200 from the British, and about 55 from the Americans. So there's no, a, a, a kind of fun fact is about how many films came to India, right? The Soviets sent about 12 films per year to India. And India made a big fuss of these films. Yeah, big Soviet film festivals where big, um, Actresses garlanded Soviet film directors. How many films did the Americans send? About 300 every year. So materially, India was completely entangled with the, with the capitalist bloc. What did non-alignment do? So there were these very public statements, right? you know, the public wooing of the Soviet Union, whether it's in film or football or, or aid, that was trying to balance these material scales, but it wasn't able to fully balance them, right? So here, uh, non-alignment is an ambition that wasn't ever fully achieved. But you also talk about uh, India's internationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, what that is? Yeah, so I think the other thing about non-alignment is it positions India as a, a basically essentially reactive force in the world in the 1940s and 50s uh, who, who is standing aside from the larger dramas of the age, right? not, not involved in the Cold War. And I think that doesn't give enough credit to the creativity and ambition that Nehru and his diplomats had when it came to sculpting the international order. So they had a vision for the international order. Um, I call it Indian internationalism. I say it, uh, it's centered around creating a post-imperial order. So the idea is to wind up imperialism and, and get rid of its legacies. That internationalism was focused on cooperating between different um, international actors rather than um, international rivalries. It was uh, focused on uh, creating a set of shared values and shared norms, and it was very attentive to the will of the people. This was a hugely ambitious program for the international organization. And for years and years, scholars have assumed that countries like India couldn't have an international vision. Only Britain and America and the great powers could shape the world. But India had a vision for the world, and it tried to shape the world according to that vision. And non-alignment doesn't capture that creativity or that ambition. Okay, and then you come to hegemonic secularism, mm -hmm. uh, for which Nehru is praised and blamed. Okay. So scholars like Ashish Nandi and others say that Nehru, in fact, Nehruvian secularism created, uh, 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 created a kind of divide in Indian consciousness, uh, which gave birth to communalism. So indirectly or directly, they blame Nehru for communalism because he tried to transplant a Western notion of secularism on the soil of India. 
and India, like other Asiatic societies, it is a traditional society and community-based society. That's the basic argument. Uh, and you also say, like, Chegas ke sari ke pallu par zari. Is mein aap kehti hain ki yeh darasal imarat ke bahar ka fasad hai. Secularism. To phir yeh hai kya? What is this secularism that that is associated with the name of Nehru? And what's the understanding of secularism in the times of Nehru? So um, I think one important thing to note about Nehru is he didn't like to define the terms that are most strongly associated with him. So he was actually given the opportunity to, to build his own little little red book, you know, like Mao had, where there was a little quotation for every for every occasion, <laughs> and he um, he gave up that opportunity. He wanted nothing That's to what do Sampurna with that. Sampurna asked him. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, so he didn't define secularism. Uh, amongst other things. Instead, he saw secularism and, uh, and a small group of people around him saw secularism as a set of practices which he regarded as long-standing practices in India. And I think um, his, India's secularism in the Nehru years had two sides. There was a, a celebratory side, a positive side, and a tricky, difficult side. Uh, and for the celebratory side, there was a clear formula in the Nehru years. What, do, what, is in, what does Indian secularism require? It requires India to celebrate its religious diversity. So we have a collection of stamps with a temple or a church, or actually there wasn't a church, a temple or a mosque or, or a, some religious uh, big monument from each of India's religions. Uh, we celebrate them in stamps. We, we celebrate um, major individuals from each of India's religions. We make sure that they are represented in government and in civil society. And we celebrate all the holidays, right? So that formula of everyone belongs in India, let's celebrate them all, that worked. Or, or that, that was the facade of the building. And when I say it was a facade, I don't mean it was false or um, kind of hiding something, deliberately hiding something more nefarious. Uh, it did set the tone, right? And it stopped, uh, it might have stopped ordinary policemen, ordinary people from from taking a, a very different turn uh, in terms of India's diversity. But there's a trickier side to Indian secularism. Secu so let me quote mm. uh, yeah, from your book, uh, while you talk about this trickier side. While India's leaders celebrated iconic individuals, buildings, uh, you were talking about that, and texts which represented Muslims and Dalits, and decisions by, <coughs> sorry, unseen government officials, tended to marginalize Muslims and reinforce existing caste hierarchies. This doesn't mean that the ideal vision of an inclusive secularism was meaningless, but just that it was limited in crucial ways. Yes, so when, when you don't define secularism, it makes it hard for ordinary civil servants to figure out what to do. Actually, even if you do define secularism, it's quite hard in tricky situations to figure out what, what the secular response is. So le let me give you some examples. If you say secularism is equal, the state taking equal distance from every uh, religious group, uh, what does that mean if you are in the IAS and you are hiring people and there's a limited number of spaces and you have to choose how many Muslims to hire or whether to hire them or not? What does it mean to be secular in that case? There's not an obvious answer. And, what happened at the time, in the 50s and 60s, is that every civil servant, every IAS wala, came up with his own answer to that question. And the same goes with um, what happens when there's a dispute over a mosque. Uh, and say the locals tear down the mosque. What is the secular answer to that in the 50s? Um, it wasn't clear to, to the... There wasn't an agreed answer about what to do about mosques being destroyed. Um, and uh, the people who had to make the decision on the ground, they tended to justify their decision not to rebuild the mosque on the basis that it would start a riot. So the secular thing to do is to avoid the riot, but that meant defaulting to uh, a destroyed mosque on the ground. Right? So does that make sense? 
Nehru saw this marginalization of Muslims and he often wrote about it. He wrote to his ministers, he wrote to chief ministers, he wrote to officials, uh, but it continued. So how do you explain it? Yeah, so this is, um, this is Nehru, uh, the man who can't, who's not an authoritarian, right? So he, he sometimes, uh, a, a local level dispute would have been brought to Nehru's attention, often by Azad. Uh, so what does Nehru do? Okay, there's a mosque in Sholapur in Hyderabad state, it's been destroyed, the locals want it rebuilt. They, they write to Azad, Azad writes to Nehru. Nehru writes to the chief minister of Hyderabad, chief minister of Hyderabad lo writes to the local district officer. All of that writing of letters takes about four months. By that time the district officer says, I can't, I, I, I can't rebuild the mosque, it would start a riot. And Nehru accepts that answer. He, he ha has experiences a lot of everyday disobedience <laughs> from uh, low-level civil servants, but he, he doesn't march to the area and physically rebuild it. He's, he's too busy to do that. So what does he do instead? When he visits the area, he tries to offer a sense of belonging to the Muslims by asking them to think about the future rather than the past. He tries to, uh, and the same, not just to Muslims, but to all, to all Indians. He tries to get them to, to turn away from thinking about what was on this site before, whether it should be re rebuilt or not, and instead to redirect their energies towards thinking about the future, towards development, towards uh, a, an, a future that doesn't involve disputes about temples and mosques, because it's about building uh, growing more food and, and building roads and tanks and, and, and developing India. So he, he, he can offer solace to the Muslims who have had their territory, their, you know, their mosques destroyed or have been turfed out of their homes, but he can't rebuild them because he needs local officers to do that. And he, instead, he offers an alternative, which is to look to the future, not the past. Yes. And then you come to socialism, and I, I found this order very interesting that you take, say, discuss secularism first and then you discuss socialism. And you say that in Hindustan, there was no one definition of the one definition. Like the same as secularism, there was also a different definition of And this is a myth that Nehru has a such socialism or a such Hindustan in Hindustan. Uh, पर इंपोज किया जो सोवियत यूनियन का सोशलिज्म था आप कहते हैं कि इट वाज टिपिकली इंडियन सोशलिज्म यू टॉक अबाउट कम्युनिटी डेवलपमेंट इनिशिएटिव्स और और एंड यू टॉक अबाउट न्यू टाउनशिप्स लाइक फरीदाबाद एंड अदर्स एंड यू आल्सो टॉक अबाउट व्हाय चंडीगढ़ इन अ डिफरेंट सेंस सो would you kindly explain what this Indian socialism is? And if there is not one socialism, but many socialisms, as you say. So was it anarchy or was it a set of experimentation? And uh, was it done by Nehru willingly? Or was he a victim of his circumstances? And he just resigned to it. Okay, so I think, in, what is Indian socialism? Um, it had a number of aspects. Uh, it was um, forged in the aftermath of knowledge about what had happened in the Soviet Union in the 40s and under Stalin. So it was definitely forged thinking about how not to do socialism. And so Indian socialism was uh, a socialism that was concerned with the development of the individual. Uh, rather than with collectivization. It was comfortable with a, a certain amount of inequality. They wanted to reduce the inequality in India, but not create an absolutely level society. Because of that, Indian socialism was also pretty comfortable with um, private property, the continuation of private property. Now, is this, is this socialism? <laughs> I think uh, there are certainly people on the left who would say that's not socialism. There are certainly people on the right who would say all socialism leads inevitably to Soviet communism, authoritarianism, and the state monopolization of the whole of social and, and political and economic life. But this was how Indians defined socialism. 
And it was, it was a compromise, but that's because everything was a compromise. Nehru liked to compromise. He liked to speak to other people and negotiate ideas with them. And so what did that mean in terms of in the big industrialists? What did it mean in terms of the countryside? So for the industrialists, rather than widespread nationalization, Indian socialism meant asking industrialists to make themselves part of the plan. Read the plan and try to adjust your production in light of it. The other thing he was asking of, social, of industrialists was that they look after their workers. This is kind of corporate social welfare that we would, what we would call it now. Uh, so what, it was much more popular in the 1950s for private enterprises to build townships for their workers, to look after their workers rather than to look after their profits and their shareholders. And so they built townships with, with roads and lighting and sanitation and housing and schools and, and trees. This was, Asking businesses to do this and them actually doing it meant that industry was nationalist, not nationalized, but it was all done under the program of creating a socialistic society. And the same goes for at the village level, where the focus was not on the state collectivizing everything and forcing the peasants to work. They, knew, they, they went to China, they examined agricultural, the agricultural situation in China in the early 50s, and they said, there is no way we can do this in India. We are a democratic society. So instead, socialism took the form of community development where they asked villagers to, to decide what they needed to develop. And then, then they asked the villagers to do it themselves. So uh, the plans, uh, there are sort of midway analysis of, analyses of the plans where they have pictures of wells that villagers have dug themselves. So socialism in the, in the Nehru years, Indian socialism, Hindustani Samajwad, was a self-help socialism. Uh, allow me to interrupt you and I'll read um, some words from your conclusion. And since it's so beautiful, uh, instead of dictating and carefully measuring all that was to go in, India's governments called on all Indians to become bakers and to mix in whatever ingredients they could contribute. This was not a deviation from pure socialism, this was Indian socialism. So please continue. Yes, and I think um, asking all the Indians to be bakers, <laughs> yes. so what are they making? They're making a cake and the plans are a carefully, carefully crafted icing on the top of a cake that otherwise didn't have a recipe. Everyone can do what they, everyone contributes as much as they can. You write, Indian socialism aimed not to demolish existing hierarchies, but to invest them with new emotional foundations and redeploy them for benevolent developmentist aims. What does this mean? Mm. So this era is the height of power of India's um, high caste, upper class elites. Yeah? And rather than, um, rather than trying to demolish their privileges, Nehru and those around him tried to ask them to use their privilege to lift up those beneath them. It's a, it's a patronizing form of language, um, unquestionably. But the idea was to take <coughs> India's existing hierarchies uh, and, and repurpose them so that you have the upper echelons raising the lower echelons. Um, th that was a form of consensus building because uh, if you completely smash and remove the power and the property from the upper echelons, one that requires either a lot of money or a lot of violence and they, they, didn't, have, they didn't have the money and they didn't want the violence. So it was a way of bringing along everyone. It meant accepting that change would be slow. Uh, yes, and then you talk about uh, uh, the strong state. Uh, one, uh, there are scholars who say that Nehru was in favor of a unitary state and a strong state, uh, but you argue otherwise. That it was not a strong state in the sense it's understood. So what is it? Nehru was not interested in that. Uh, what is that? Yeah. Um, so I think when it comes to the strong state, 
this is probably 100% myth. Some of, the, some of the other myths are, I, I say in the conclusion, they, all of these things are myths, but they're all myths in different ways. But the strong state, the idea that um, India inherited a strong state from the Raj, and that India's leaders took over the levers of that state without wanting to change it at all, two myths, right? If you study the end of the Raj, it's not a very strong state. It's not very effective, right? I mean, all you have to do is look at the Bengal famine or the way they handled the Quit India movement to understand that the Raj uh, strength in terms of absolute power, fine, but in terms of effectiveness of government, that's not what the Raj was about. So then they didn't inherit something that was strong, and then they didn't want to take over what they had and keep it as is. So every single one of the seminal projects of the day were built at a distance from the existing administration. So the Planning Commission, um, the Damodar Valley Corporation, uh, Faridabad, uh, the Faridabad Development Board, uh, all of the government-run enterprises, the Central Social Welfare Board, all of these things were set up as semi-autonomous entities at a distance from the existing administration precisely because they were unhappy with their inheritance. Now, so there are lots of experiments in the 1950s and they are wound up at the end of the 1950s and in the early 1960s. So what you end up with is all these experiments uh, in decentralization that are drawn back into the center's control by the 1960s, but that made the state very heterogeneous uh, and unwieldy rather than centralizing. So while concluding this chapter, you write, uh, write about the pattern. Here's the pattern you write. Indian statesmen and stateswomen recognized that India was a union in the making. Uh, now this India as a union, it has created a lot of controversy recently. So would like to say more about it? What do you want me to say more about? What do you mean when you say that India was a union in the making, okay. that they understood and what this understanding means? Yeah, I, I think that meant that, um, well, I think there's a couple of things here. So first of all, in the constitution, it's recognized that the country will change even after the constitution is inaugurated. So there are a number of chapters and provisions that are recognized as provisional, as only going to last 10 years, etc. They expect, they wanted the country to change. They desperately wanted it to change and they expected it to do so. Um, and all the nation building projects were set up with that in mind. And then you come to democracy or the make of <coughs> successful democracy and, and you say that uh, this notion that in democracy was successful is, uh, is again a myth. Why do you say so? Okay, so this is not me imposing my judgment upon Indian democracy. I look at how uh, people discussed Indian democracy over the course of the first three elections. And what you see is particularly after the second general election and again just before the third general election, there's a great deal of anxiety about democracy in India. India's elites, partially led by J.P. Narayan, who's very cynical about parliamentary democracy, but also supplemented by Balwantre Mehta, who wants to uh, decentralize democracy and introduce Panchayati Raj. But there's a wide range of people who are very concerned about the health of India's democracy in the 1950s and early 1960s. Why are they concerned? They're not happy with the way caste is manifesting itself in election campaigns. They're very concerned about how much money is being spent in election campaigns. And, and they're, they're newly aware in the early 1960s that when businessmen donate money to uh, ministers, in their election campaigns, they expect a quid pro quo. And so some of the first uh, co controversies over corruption emerge in that period. Um, and yeah, so th Indians themselves are worried about democracy in the 1960s, and they host a number of conventions to try to renew their democracy at that time. So it's not my judgment, it's theirs. Yeah. And you write, again, uh, as conclusion, uh, the idealists of the Constituent Assembly were aware of how democracy had functioned in India prior to 1947, but they were convinced that a free India would operate differently. And they were sure that supposedly defunct customs like casteism would be discarded and that they could provide safeguards against unwelcome new ones. 
such as the corrupting influences of money and the manipulation of the administration in favor of the ruling party. Uh, and then you write, self-confidence is also a measure of success. By the end of the first decade of democratic rule, India's democratically elected leaders were expressing doubt in their own system. So while you write that communists has come onto the side of democracy, and yet you say this. Mm. So not only were they expressing doubt uh, about their own system, they were also working to rejuvenate it. So they had, uh, from, from the late 1950s and early 1960s, they developed the whole idea of the code of conduct. And this emerges out of the Kerala uh, controversy where the communists are ousted um, by, by protests. Um, what is the mo what, so they decide that there's a lot of, there's rising violence, there's rising misbehavior in the way Indians are conducting their their democratic politics. So they try to develop a number of codes of conduct, codes of conduct for students, for union workers, for ministers, uh, and, and for elections. And so the model code of conduct, which now governs India's elections, emerges from this period. So not only are they having doubts, but they are also trying to renew the democracy in this period, trying to find new, new guardrails for it, new ways of educating the people to use it properly. Yeah, and then you conclude with uh, your chapter on high modernism. So Nehru is also seen as uh, someone who modernizes, who tries to modernize India, and is blamed for that. He's, he's tearing India away from his traditions. That's, uh, that's uh, the allegation. Uh, but again, you say that this is high modernism, again, is a myth. Uh, but, like in Jaza, I have written you that I have said that the people who are in the middle of the day are not going to be able to do it. Why? And in the middle of the day, the Science Academy, the Lalitical Academy, the institutions are going to be able to do it. But in the middle of the day, the modernization process is going to be able to do it. The chief modernizer is going to be able to do it. And again, uh, not in a very positive sense. Then, is par apne zada vakt kharch kyon nahi kiya? Or agar nahi, to abhi kuch kehna chahenge aap? Okay, so I think I could have written a book called um, Nehru's Socialism: A History in Seven Myths, Nehru's Modernism: A History in Seven Myths. Um, there's just a lot to pack in, and I wanted to. I felt like I had to address this idea that dams were the temples of modern India, right? Um, uh, and I think the, the whole idea of authoritarian high modernism is that you take an idea from outside and you plunk it in without really much thought or care about um, the place where you are dropping it in or the people who live there. And I show uh, through the example of the, the Modar Valley Corporation, but also through ch the example of Chandigarh and how it was built, that actually the modernists themselves were very concerned with place. They had a particular approach to India's traditions. They thought that Indians tra India's traditions could be parsed. They could, they could take the bits that they liked and were useful of India's traditions, the, the beautiful bits or the helpful bits, and then discard the rest. So they had a particular approach. They didn't see tradition as something that was all or none. And I felt I had to address this, but there was just too much to, to address, I think. So you're right that modernism in India was internationalist. Uh, true, but that didn't mean its adherents blindly followed scripts laid down by foreigners ignorant of India. It's fair to say that modernists didn't have a strong uh, allegiance to the past, but they didn't jettison it altogether. Most viewed India's past as divisible, and they sought to extract what was either aesthetically pleasing or useful, as you say. Uh, from countries' historical practices, separating what they liked from what could be discarded. So let, let me talk about the, let me address the first part of that quotation, which is about the international experts. And let me give you the example of Chandigarh and Le Corbusier. So Le Corbusier comes to India to meet with the Planning Commission, including Nehru, um, 
in uh, the early 1950s, and at this meeting, Indians, the, the planning commission barrage him with a series of questions, uh, and they tell him, they tell the Corbusier, high, high rise buildings don't work in India. That is Le Corbusier's thing, yeah? <laughs> that's, that's, that's his dream, his vision of the ideal society manifested in these huge high rises. And he comes as the international expert, and they tell him that's not gonna work here. <laughs> and so they make him mold his ideas to India, and then they tell him, what we really want from you is to train Indian architects. And so that's what he and uh, Jane Drew and her husband work to do. They train India's architects. So this is not uh, blind adherence. They don't kowtow, they, don't, uh, they aren't starstruck by Le Corbusier. Uh, they, they want to use his expertise uh, to build India rather than, um, yeah, they want to use his expertise rather than to bow to it. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.